So I grew up at a very little uh, town on Ukraine, but in 1976 I moved uh, to Moscow. I was very lucky to escape the entrance examination, so I got to Moscow State University. And I grew up mathematically there on Gelfand Seminar. And at that time it was the absolutely great place to learn mathematics and uh, many other things. So it was lots of mathematics, lots of culture. And there were many other uh, uh, people around, and so I learned a lot uh, on Gelfand Seminar, of course, but also uh, from Joseph Bernstein, uh, Simon Gindikin, Yuri Manin, and a little later Alexander Bellinson. <coughs> uh, then in '82, I graduated from Moscow State University, and I should admit that uh, it was absolutely great place to uh, learn mathematics and study mathematics, but it was for young mathematicians, it was a little bit difficult uh, to escape the system, the official system. And so somebody had to help you. And so in my case, I got uh, great help from uh, Gelfand and Gindikins, who, <coughs> with the help of whom I, with the help of Gelfand, I moved to uh, to Institute of Crystallography, where I became a graduate student in 1982. And uh, in, uh, in the very beginning, like January, 85 things got better in the country, so Gelfand uh, organized his uh, new laboratory, mathematical laboratory, and so he took me there in the very beginning of January as a first member, and so this was great. Uh, but <laughs> actually, one uh, accidental thing happened, so on my way out of uh, Institute of Crystallography, where I was a graduate student officially of the director, he said, okay, you're leaving, but can you at least do a little bit, can you maybe write a little uh, report for my article uh, in Encyclopedia on some mm, things related to electron microscopy and reconstruction of biological objects. That was the subject his laboratory was working on. So I said, okay, he gave me some papers to look. Uh, I looked at them, didn't understand anything, but understood what the problem was. So the problem was that uh, in biology you have some big uh, molecule like ribosome, and you, cannot, you can make only one uh, picture of this uh, object because it's destroyed. And so, but what they do, they put many, many objects, put them randomly and take one picture. But then you have to reconstruct, uh, to do tomography by reconstructing this object, having many projections from different angles, but you have no idea what the angles are. So I need to write something. And so I wrote, I realized that you can actually reconstruct the angles between uh, these projections, unknown projections, if you know the projections. And so I wrote this to uh, this is little note. But then, somewhere like middle of January, I got a call. The first and last call ever I got from the director. He said, where did you get this? And I said, sorry, I didn't understand the papers. I just wrote my, my thoughts about this. And he said, so you found this on your own? I said, yes. He said, oh, don't you understand that's important? Write a paper. And so after this, so for about, so I wrote a paper, we wrote a paper with Weinstein, and for about two years I was heavily involved in this. Uh, I wrote a number of papers on the subject, but this ended up uh, in a very funny way. So later, like in 88, I was approached by uh, some guy, applied mathematician, who said, you know, I'm working for military, and uh, we know that you are interested in reconstruction objects from random projections, we're also interested in this, we have lots of benefits, so why don't you work with us? And then I hear that my uh, voice saying that, you know, I no longer work on the subject. And so this was the end of the discussion. And later I realized that uh, if one works with military, at least in Soviet Union, so you lose your freedom to do mathematics, and this was the last thing I wanted to do. So. Luckily, I skipped, and uh, I never had any problems after that with my freedom in mathematics. In general mathematics, I uh, prefer to work on crossroads uh, where different uh, subjects, mathematical subjects, meet, so that I have uh, more freedom where to move and how to move. And so in more concrete uh, terms, from, from like mid of the 80s, I was very interested in the problem of understanding of properties of integrals of algebraic, or algebraic geometric nature. 
uh, by using some methods of uh, arithmetic algebraic geometry. Uh, and uh, so this allows to make uh, conclusions about integrals without calculating them uh, by using, as I said, some uh, conjectures in uh, arithmetic algebraic geometry due to Bellinson mostly, uh, which uh, are not available but have a huge predictable uh, power. And so I just want to explain a little bit uh, what I'm talking about because it sounds and very general. <coughs> so first of all, this problem uh, of understanding of integrals motivated algebraic geometry uh, always from the time of Euler. And in 19th century, uh, the attempt to understand integrals, Abelian integrals led to creation of a uh, theory of curves on the Jacobians. In 20th century, it was the Hodge theory and mixed Hodge theory, Hodge, uh, Griffiths, Deligne. Uh, but then, uh, Things uh, changed somewhere in around 1992 when Bellinson uh, came up with his uh, con conjectures on uh, mixed motives and their properties uh, uh, relating them to special values of all functions, the extensions of them. And uh, so what I was doing uh, after was trying to understand what implications this has for, for this problem of calculating of integrals. So here is an example. So if you consider some rational number q, then if you're interested in numbers like logarithm of qi and some of them with some integral coefficients, OK, this is just logarithm of the product of qi. So that's a rational number. And so basically, uh, the point is that this number is defined modular 2 pi i z. And so if, you, if you're interested uh, in this number's model at 2 pi i z, that all you need to know is this number. It's very simple. One way it's obvious, other way it's a statement about uh, from transcendental theory. But what if you take more complicated functions, the simplest of them is a the dial logarithm, which you can write as a series generalizing the logarithm, which are convergent uh, when absolute value of z less than 1. And you wanted to study the question. So you wanted to understand, again, some of the values of the uh, dialogarithms at rational numbers. And you wanted to know this uh, modular uh, something because uh, dialogarithm uh, can be analytically extended but has monodromy. So it has to be modular 2 pi logarithm of some non-zero rational number. So, OK, so you wanted to know uh, this number and all about this number, for example, when it is zero. And so the claim which you make that this is zero uh, modular to pi log q, if and only if the following algebraic statement holds, that if you consider sum of this n i, it's an integer times one minus q i tensor q i, and this is zero in the abelian group q star tensor q star over z. And so this is a free group with the basis p tensor q up to little 2 torsion with p and q primes. So it's very easy to handle this question. This is just you can handle this for any collection of numbers immediately. But this question looks difficult and transcendental. And this theory of mixed motives, arithmetic theory of mixed motives, uh, imply that actually uh, the question whether when it's zero modular this little freedom is equivalent to this algebraic statement. So that's what I mean by uh, making statements about integrals uh, using um, arithmetic algebraic geometry. And I call this arithmetic analysis because you make statements about analytic, make statements analytic nature, but you use arithmetic basically. So, um, and uh, in general, you can describe this as a studying of mixed state, uh, sorry, mixed motives and their periods and more generally, uh, motivic Hof algebra. And the general idea about this is that whenever you have any integral of algebraic geometric nature, it produces you some element in, in the certain Hof algebra. This is this motivic Hof algebra. And uh, this kind of motivic avatar of this integral. And uh, the main benefit which you get after you uh, getting to this more sophisticated level is that now you, you live in a Hopf algebra, so you can apply the coproduct uh, for this uh, element, and then things get simpler. 
And so what's written here is just uh, the first instance of this uh, kind of line of thought where you apply, where what's written here is a coproduct of the motivic element which corresponds to this element. And it's much simpler, it's actually just some algebraic expression. And it keeps all the information about uh, the number. And uh, so that's, that's the point. Uh, so I first arrived in CHS in June of 1990, so almost 30 years ago, 29. And it's very clear why, because the borders of Soviet Union just opened up. So this is the first chance I had. And EHS is the place uh, where all kind of new ideas in uh, arithmetic algebraic geometry were coming to us, to Moscow, like 70s, 80s, 60s. And so I obviously wanted to see the place and Paris. So that's why I came when I had the first uh, chance. And so why I came into chess uh, all this, you know, years after. So the main magnet for me in chess is Maxim Kansevich, whom I know very well from 1980. And a discussion with Maxim uh, was and is the main, one of the main sources of joy in my mathematical life. So I wanted to keep them going. But this is not the only reason, because uh, there are other people. First of all, you meet new people when you come and you don't know whom. And secondly, there are people who work here permanently. And it's also very interesting to discuss with them. So I just want to give you one example um, how this uh, worked out. So in something like 1996, I came to HES and I met Dirk Reimer, who was working at that time in HES. And he was telling me about uh, this amazing computations he and David Broadhurst were doing, uh, calculating uh, <coughs> multi-loop contributions uh, to Feynman integrals, this kind of fine dimensional Feynman integrals. And they discovered uh, that they get multiple zeta numbers and multiple Euler sums, uh, some little generalization of them, and this was very exciting. And on the other hand, I worked on this subject, so uh, the main idea was whenever you see integral, and they are integrals, uh, you, need, you want to put them to the motivic framework. You, and so I was saying that uh, one needs to, e even in general, so if you have any Feynman integral, one should take its, uh, uh, the corresponding correlation functions and make motivic correlation functions, meaning uh, putting, uh, them, putting their motivic avatars, not them, into some huge Hof algebra, motivic Hof algebra. And then you have a great benefit because now you can apply the coproduct. So motivic Hopf algebra is, very roughly speaking, is an algebra of functions on a group. And so you can use a group law. But this is actually a very vague analogy because this motivic Hopf algebra is a Hopf algebra in the category of grotendix pure motive. So it's not exactly uh, living in a vector space. But so I was saying that, okay, so it's not clear, it wasn't clear to me what the general question is about calculation of this uh, correlation functions, but if we put them to this motivic Hopf algebra, we can start asking different questions, which we didn't see before, like uh, uh, what is the coproduct of those motivic uh, correlation functions? Uh, do the, all these motivic uh, correlation functions, are they closed on the coproduct? If they are, what kind of quotients of motivic Hopf algebra you get? And so that's maybe one of the ways to try to, to handle the, the general problem. And so this all was kind of reaction on talking with Dirk. And later on, all my uh, interaction, most of my interactions with uh, physics community was somehow uh, inspired uh, by these discussions. So it continued over many, many years, but this was, these discussions in 1996 were very crucial, first of all, to formulating this kind of uh, approach, and secondly, uh, to getting contacts with uh, physicists after that. So, and many other contacts with other people, of course. First of all, it's a great honor to me to be a uh, uh, first holder of Gretchen Barry Mazur chair. Uh, regarding the question, uh, what would it bring to me, what I think about this, for me the main benefit is, uh, of course it's a possibility to come to HS, but uh, the main thing is that I have uh, ability to give recorded lectures. And so I already gave, uh, uh, finished last week, uh, the lecture series on quantum geometry of modular spaces and representation theory. 
which was about my joint work with Volodya Fok and Ling Hui Shen. And I hope to be another uh, lecture series in future on quantum field theory, so this is the main benefit. Surely, uh, so uh, there, are con uh, there are points of contact, uh, so I was lucky to be in Boston somewhere like 94, 93, 94, 95. And that time, a little later, had a lot of discussions with Barry about uh, the following things. So I was studying the action of this motivic Gallo group on the motivic fundamental group of uh, C star, punctured, and P torsion points. And uh, I bumped into some strange connection with the modular curve at that time, modular curves. And so we were discussing with Barry. So why these things happen? So basically what happens is that the simplest subquotient of the image, non-abelian subquotient of the image of this motivically algebra, turns out to coincide with the chain complex of the modular curve of level p, and so y1 of p. And so why? It was a big mystery. It is a big mystery. And so given lectures two weeks ago at, at the conference, I just wanted to give a very update on what happened after this, so this relation with modular manifolds of high rank, uh, GL3, GL4, and the role major symbols, major modular symbols play there. The generalization of uh, classical modular symbols to this group GLM. Actually, so as I said, I grew up in a very small town. There was basically nothing to do there. And so I was sitting at home and reading books available. And originally, at Soviet Union at the time, there was a number of books on uh, interesting subjects like astronomy or even nuclear physics. And so I remember buying one of them, it was like 1969, by Muhin. It was called Entertaining Nuclear Physics. And I read it through many times. I read it like Three Musketeers. And the point is that it was a very serious book, but also very entertaining. So it explains the subject seriously and without you know, glossing things over. But on the other hand, uh, it can be read by a kid. And so, but then I realized that I actually prefer to do mathematics, solving, start solving problems, and so I, I shift to mathematics. But this kind of access to, to books which are serious but still available, I, I think this was crucial. So another example was, uh, it was already in mathematics, I remember reading a paper in magazine Quant, and, uh, when I was in high school, uh, written by Gendikin on uh, the Golden Theorem. It's about proving of Gauss, Gauss reciprocity law. Again, it was, it was a proof, but it was written in a way a high school uh, uh, you know, student can understand. So this was the way I got interested in this. I get excited when I see a mystery in mathematics. And so, uh, to give a kind of concrete example how this motivates, the study just want, wants to give an example of this mystery. So we were talking about this mot motivic symmetries, motivic Galois group, uh, motivic Hopp algebra. It's kind of idea of motivic symmetries. But unlike Galois symmetries, they do not come in a direct way. So they come through Grotendieck's uh, kind of dream of motives and then his idea of having Tanakian formalism, which brings you, so if you have this category of mixed motifs, you get back the, the group of symmetry, but you don't see it directly, first of all. It's not a primary object, it's kind of secondary after you see the category itself. And in Gallo theory, it's just the opposite. The Gallo group acts on everything, then you get the whole theory. And so uh, I was motivated and actually studying uh, the idea that actually, uh, Mm, the, the, the ideas and somehow the paradigm of quantum field theory should actually play a very uh, considerable role in our understanding of how these uh, symmetries uh, come out in a more natural way. And so in particular, so example is that if you consider a real mixed Hodge structure, for example, the simplest uh, object is on the fundamental group of, let's say, of a curve. So you get lots of numbers, periods. But you can organize them uh, as infinite connection of numbers. You can organize them into, uh, uh, into correlation functions of just one Feynman integral. And uh, then 
you can understand that actually these correlation functions, they provide you explicitly the action of the real Hodge uh, Gallo group, the Tonakian Gallo group of the category of mixed uh, uh, real mixed Hodge structures explicitly. And so now this kind of Feynman integral allows you to, uh, to produce uh, this action of the Hodge symmetries explicitly uh, without constructing first the mixed Hodge structure. It's the other way. You get mixed Hodge structure from this construction. And so, and as I said, so originally I was interested in applications of uh, you know, this arithmetic algebraic geometry to analysis or to physics, but uh, then the things turned out in the other way, and so it seems that it's actually physical ideas uh, should play an important role in understanding where these uh, symmetries and structures coming from, uh, because uh, many of them are still conjectural and we have no clue. For example, Bellinson's conjectures, which underline all this line of thought about uh, mixed motifs, so is the relation to special values of L functions. We have absolutely no idea why this should be true and why this should happen, but uh, they're extremely important. So that's an example. Thank you.